I was just telling you, Phil, that I spent a real pleasant afternoon with Merle Travis. You talked about you both. And he, you know, he was recalling for me. I don't know whether it was a specific time that you sang for him or whether there were a number of occasions that you had to sing we for him as, as a... Merle Travis Do you remember? Merle? Oh, you mean with Merle? Yeah. Oh, when we were little, yeah. But, but the last time that it really comes to mind is just before we made it, we were singing, or we had made it, I don't know. Uh, we... They had a Merle Travis Day in Muhlenberg County, and we sang over there. It was really fun. Also, it was the time when he came to uh, Nashville to be on the Grand Ole Opry, and we were in Kentucky on vacation. Yeah. We went down. I, yeah, this, was, oh, this was... Oh, we were, Sang in the alley. Yeah, we sang in the alley out back. Dad was picking, and he was picking, and Mose Rager, another friend of theirs, that kind of the three of them grew up sort of together, mm -hmm. was picking the guitar, that thumb pick style. And, and uh, we sang, I think, you know, a little bit. Your dad said that, uh, or rather, uh, he said that your dad was probably one of the two or three more influential people in the way he picked guitar. Uh, how much effect did he have on your own style? Uh, well, he taught us, you know, the whole thing. You know, that's the only way we learned. But uh, I can pick very little. I'm sorry. We really to say. can't. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, I've can't been play thinking it. about going back and, and studying with my father, is because it? <laughs> it's a, it's a, his, it's an art. You know, an excellent art. There's a lot of folk people who try to do it now, but it's still not the same as, as Merle and, and, and Dad play. Most regular, I'm afraid, is dead now, isn't he? Yeah. Well, Chet Adkins took over, I guess, of course, where we're, uh, we're, uh, uh, they left off and uh, took it, of course, to the realms of the impossible. But uh, even And he's still taking it. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he himself, uh, through the friendship of our father, was responsible for getting us to, into Nashville and I guess into the recording business. Yeah. So we owe it all to Thumbpick Guitar Picking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Vocally, you know, who were some of the people uh, very early that, that, that had that company uh, that impressed well, you? Well, when we were singing with the family show, we were learning um, uh, the songs we were singing uh, outside of just some of the things that uh, there weren't harmony parts to, but uh, were people like uh, Delmore Brothers songs and uh, the York Brothers songs and... Uh, uh, very, they were even old uh, country uh, things. Bales brothers. Time. Bales brothers. Yeah, things like that. I mean, we'd heard of the Milo twins. We didn't even hear of their. Well, records. I'd seen them in the films, you yeah, know. Yeah, with Roy Acuff and, and the films that were uh, shown on television at that time. But uh, those were the kind of songs we were singing. The. Uh, well, then the Leuven brothers. The Leuven brothers. Yeah, yeah. they were. Uh, but there's a lot of brother acts, the family we acts, and uh, country music, which wasn't didn't happen in pop music at all. But I think the early ones were the uh, York Brothers and uh, uh, Delmore Brothers, when we were really small. How old were you when you first appeared professionally? As, I was uh, s uh, six. Uh, <laughs> I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't too professional. Okay. <laughs> Where was that, by the way? And uh, we were in uh, Shenandoah, Iowa. It was on a radio, radio station. They started off with a Christmas show one year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we yeah. sang on the Christmas show early in the mornings, and they got a lot of mail, so we put us on regular. Oh, well, yeah, it wasn't, it was every Saturday. <laughs> well, yeah, I had it. For had, a while. had a radio show every Saturday, and then every every day, yeah. about a year after that. <laughs> and we worked up with the Everly family just under the same format until right we graduated. <laughs> Until live radio died out and they started playing records, and that's where we knew where we should go. <laughs> yeah, we figured there wasn't much future left, you know. We were in Knoxville, Tennessee, though, when that happened. You weren't consciously, were you con well, were you consciously playing uh, rock and roll when you went into it? Did See, you we, this is the, the, that's the one thing, like, we, we liked country mu music, and we still do, but we were going to school, and the people that uh, we were influenced by at school, our friends and the people we associated with there didn't know what country music was. In Iowa, they weren't up at, uh, when our shows were on, like five o'clock in the morning, listening to it. And they weren't aware of it, and they didn't know what a guitar was really at those, at those times. They called it a banjo or a mandolin. And, but we were influenced by what they liked, you know, and we, because we were typically uh, our environment. Mm -hmm. This was where Yet, this was in Iowa and Tennessee, but most and of they were influenced in by uh, rhythm and blues in Tennessee very, very much, you know, yes. and so were we. And uh, so uh, I found that uh, some of the, uh, the beats that were lacking in country music, you know, I found very satisfying in the rhythm and blues fields. And you could, you could do uh, country songs kind of that way without, you know, it was yeah. up in that time it was like a, uh, country music was a, 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 like a two-step dance beat, you know, like... Uh, 
uh, Hank Williams beat was a, uh, that's Lefty Frizzell. Le sure. Lefty Frizzell. Lino Lefty Frizzell was one of the I think one of the very first uh, country crossovers to pop because we were playing on a station in Evansville, Indiana one summer, and that's when Mom and Daddy Waltz were, was out, you know. And that, that got on their pop charts there. I don't think it did it nationally, but it was huge in that city. Well, why was everybody so surprised when uh, the first, I guess, exponent we heard of it was Presley or Carl Perkins playing mm -hmm. a combination of blues and country and western because God I knows. I was as surprised as yeah, anybody else. Yeah, the, the, that yeah. influence has been there for years. There's well, been a blues strain throughout country. Elvis, music, Presley, w Elvis really? Presley walked on television. You know, a young, a young personality, which wasn't really allowed in show business that, that much at that time, you know, with a guitar, you know, with a down-to-earth attitude. And it was, to me, it was like a revelation. It was like, all of a sudden, like, I was being noticed myself because I played the guitar. I, you know, was in the influence yeah. by the same atmosphere, and so was the rest of the kids. Up until know. that point, a guitar, everybody thought a guitar was a banjo yeah. from, from the uh, Peabody days, you know, when... Uh, Elmer Peabody used to play. Everybody considered anything that that shape was a banjo, and and when Presley said it was, became a guitar and became important. Well, immediately it uh, it was the change. It was like accepted the the adults had all of a sudden noticed that there was, you know, something other than than big bands. And they were still doing the jitterbug and you know and uh, big bands. Still, everybody said big bands, big bands. Wasn't this actually though happening on two fronts? There was folk, the folk revival that was going on with people like the Kingston Trio. They, that happened, and, uh, what, in 58, 59? It was just like a... The folk revival uh, that yeah, that was didn't a really hit any problems until Tom Dooley, really. Mm -hmm. And which was uh, uh, was fifty eight, I think it was, and and you must remember too, like we for cut our first record in fifty seven, but we were involved in all this. Uh, but Presley was in fifty five, mm -hmm. you know, which is uh, a couple of years earlier. But we were, couldn't get a job. <laughs> We'd like to have done it, but we couldn't get to, till '57 is when we got. He opened the door for a lot of people who'd been uh, strictly country and western for a while. Though we had Berlin Husky and Sonny James and Marty there was a, within a year. Well, on the for show. a while, there was a rash of country artists putting choruses behind it, and it was being accepted into pop field. But that was a one-shot thing. That wasn't Which is what, was, what I was called a true. Uh, the true new rock and roll of what the, the, the term rock and roll which I never really yeah. sort of liked. Way a bad term anyhow but uh, like you know that was Buddy Holly was in the south was in Lubbock Texas starting something brand new. It was like the outcast of country music really. <laughs> yeah it's, it's the truth yeah. The, we had long hair and I didn't like that. New we generation didn't, of we country didn't, music. You couldn't get on we, could, we had an audition for the yeah. Grand Ole well, couldn't like, get on. We, I didn't want I wasn't a cowboy I didn't want to wear cowboy suits and cowboy boots mm -hmm. you know I just didn't feel like a cowboy mm -hmm. you know and uh, that was the accepted thing at that time, and no drums. They didn't. Drums were not were taboo on, mm -hmm. on the Grand Ole Opry stage. In fact, I think Phil and I were the very first to ever have drums on the Grand Ole Opry. And all we took Opry. was a snare. It was a snare, and Drum. a cymbal. What kind of reaction did you have? Well, we that's were Bye Bye Love was, it was out. Bye Bye Love. You know, we had auditioned earlier for the Grand Ole Opry about a year before that, and uh, and we just uh, they didn't. Uh, you know what? We didn't fit. Our hair was too long, and, and we was, looked we odd. Didn't, we looked and looked like country musicians. And musicians. we had we had pegged trousers at that time. Everybody wore pegged trousers, <laughs> you know, at least down in that area. And we had that, you know, and ducktails, what they used to call ducktails. So you didn't really fit. Uh, I don't. know, They made them like this anyhow, you know. But uh, we did uh, get on though, which is. But well, I'm very, we're we very on. proud of. Them, I yes. Am. Yeah. You know. It's a big moment. It was. I've got a picture at home of it. Martha White's Grand Ole Opry with us on stage with uh, Floyd Kramer playing piano. Too bad Chester Chester did Chester Atkins played with us on the Grand Ole Opry, backed us up a few times. We didn't I don't have him in the picture on that one. But Floyd Kramer, uh, on drums, Buddy Harmon. A big drummer. Very fine drummer, you know. It was uh, it's one of my cherished pictures. <laughs> There's a, another question. Oh yeah, uh, the importance I think of, of Boodle Bryant in what you've done. Uh, in, in the, well, it's very the, important. The, songs, so. yeah, the man is, a, you know, it borders on genius, I think. Well, how, who sele how did you select the, the songs that you recorded, say, starting with, with Bye Bye Love? Who made the decision, you know? Archie Blyer, when we were signed to the Cadence label, we came and met Archie the same day that we met Boudlow. And uh, this was just a couple of days after we had met uh, the publisher, Wesley. you know, that, that said he would, was going to get us the audition. And Archie Blyer was in the studio, in this little rehearsal studio at the publisher's office, and 
Buglo was there. We walked in. They said, what do you want to record? We had some songs of our own. They said, what do you think of this song? It was Bye Bye Love. We would have, if it had been Rice Straw, we would have sang it. Yeah, if it had <laughs> You know, what they think? We were looking for the session money. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the money. <laughs> you know. We didn't need the song. And the money, had, though. Budlow had had the song for a year or two. Nobody and Archie was do it. firmly believed in it. Archie yeah. liked it. He'd know. had this. He tried it with a couple other people, but it hadn't happened. But it hadn't happened. And, and he said it came alive. But everybody also. at that moment was looking for the country field. And they had no idea that it was going to go pop, I don't think. And Don put a rhythm and blues uh, kind of, uh, I guess you call it a rhythm and blues intro or whatever it was yeah, on it and made it in, we made it into something else. And then uh, after that, though, the selections were... Uh, then Budlow just wrote a natural follow-up for each thing. Is that the way it happened through yeah. the rest of the cadence? Yeah, there? there'd be a lot of songs. We went, when we did, before we did Wake Up Little Susie, we looked, we were looking, we must have looked at, a, I think, a thousand songs. And uh, it felt like it at least. And well, then, then but the, when you brought, you brought it Susie... Walk in. With the yeah, songs sooner or later. Later. It's and Phil and I were writing too, though, mm -hmm. at the time. And sometimes when he wouldn't come up with something, we would have something. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to work out. It was a winning combination, which I think is always the case with any artist and writers. You know. That's I that. think the first switch now, the first real switch that you had then was with All I Have to Do is Dream. That was sort of a different kind of song from well, what you uh, had done. Uh, that's again, a lot of this is, a lot of the um, uh, importance of it is placed on Boudlow. Boudlow felt it was time. I guess in, in when he was in his preparatory work, you know, but uh, I remember hearing, I remember uh, vividly hearing the demo of, because uh, the demos were always like that Budlo did, where it was just he and, a vo uh, and his guitar, and I heard it, and, and I think they could have put out the demo and it would have hit, you know, with just Budlo and his guitar, the song was so good. And At uh, that time, there was nothing like it. No. The, record, the record's were, sales were down that summer, too, you know. In fact, that was in Chester Atkins. We must give him credit, because yeah. he walked in and he had the, you know, what they call a vibrato now on a guitar, which is standard equipment. Yeah, on an, on an amplifier. An amplifier. But it wasn't then. It wasn't then. Mm -hmm. The first uh, record was ever on, I think, was, or possibly pop record that ever made it was the one that uh, he built himself. You know, he had a chord and gene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which well, is so ordinary. On, on, uh, devoted to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, but it's yeah. so ordinary now that so that time it was now. a brand new thing. He uh, Chester brought it in and used it, mm -hmm. and yeah. now what they call it a wah wah pedal is something he built and we used on "Till I Kissed You" on the guitar. Right. And we must thank Chester Atkins for a lot of those. Well, he wonderful it, like as we said earlier, it, we wouldn't have gotten to Nashville to get the opportunity if it hadn't been for Chester Atkins. That's one of the songs you wrote, wasn't Kathy's Clown? Probably the the most successful yeah, individual. Probably, so yeah. that, that's got to be one of the greatest all-time recordings out of the 10-year chunk of time. Do you, you know, know, I think the, the most interesting thing I've, that I've been thought about lately is that the, there's another important factor in that, that drum beat in it is, is Buddy Harmon's, you know, uh, is important. That's never been done since. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's like an, um, an individualistic drum beat. It's, nobody's used it since. Which is normally you find patterns that are successful copied, but mm -hmm. they, nobody's done that one. How did that song come initially? How did you uh, sit down and write Well, Donald was uh, yeah. over to his house, and uh, he called me, and he had uh, he had it half done, and uh, we were dying said, for a song at that time. Yeah, we, uh, we had, this was our first record on Warner Brothers, and everybody said, uh uh, never and we cut twelve already. <laughs> We'd cut 12 sides. Yeah. And they said, well, we never get it. Album. We knew we hadn't had it. We didn't have the song And they wanted yet. to put out a couple other things, but we said we didn't have one yet. It was right. And uh, and we knew that everybody was just waiting for that first record on Warner's to say, well, you didn't. You know, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have it anymore. And so it was like something we needed, and it was, a, I think, an extreme point, a turning point, too, at that time. It was 1960, then. I remember one time, I guess it must have been 1964, very specifically the date and location and everything, you know, uh, riding down the freeway in a car and just listening with one ear to some close harmony and I thought gee the Everleys have done something a little bit different you know and then of course as they went on and they sang I want to hold your hand <laughs> and so forth and so on how, how did you feel when you when you heard the, the harmonies that you've been putting down you know reflected back from you know how far away from these people well, the albums were brought to us of the Beatles what two years before they hit here oh, I didn't hear Donald had heard them either. yeah they were given to us and things uh, but we just, we never did jump on anything. We never had really, at that time, recorded anything anybody else had recorded much, you know. We didn't believe in covering when, because uh, a lot of it goes back when we, uh, we cut Bye Bye Love. We were working on a tent show, Grand Ole Opry tent show in Mississippi when it came out, you know. And uh, uh, we were down there and somebody said, uh, was on the show with us, said that Webb Pierce has, has covered you. Uh, and that was like a, to, in a country field of putting the, the mark of death on your forehead, you know, because Wood Pierce had had 24 number ones in a row 
you know, which is probably is as phenomenal as you get, and large sales. Uh, and we just kind of packed it up then, you know, we figured it was all over, and it scared us to death. So we always kept away from covering it, although fortunately it worked out okay for well, us. But you know. they were reflecting back what you had done, you know, and especially uh. in the harmony. I saw so much of it. I saw it even, even as, as late as uh, Rubber Soul with a thing called I'm Looking Through You. I, saw, I heard the Everly This was inevitable, there. I think, because mm. at the time, I, uh, in 63, 64, American uh, rock music or beat music had... You, First of all, it never, I don't think, ever had the respectability it deserved. Everybody looked at it as kind of like, ah, right, let's let it, you know, ignore it and it'll go away. And we would do television it. shows and it, and no, no uncertain terms tell us that uh, the only reason we were on the show because it was a necessary evil to entertain what few, oh, a few of you know, the people that were stealing hubcaps in the street that might happen to be watching television might enjoy it. And that was the only reason we were on. But it was brought back from England. And like Phil has said, the Americans have an inferiority complex. And anything English has got to be educated and good. <laughs> and so it started all over again. And it will last maybe another 20 years until they bring it back from somewhere nobody doesn't really cater to. But it was necessary because the music was not doing that well, you know. And so the, and the reflections about it, as far as like the comparative uh, aspect between their harmonies and our harmony structures, there are only so many harmony notes, there's, you know, uh, thirds and fifths, and, and that's about the extent of it. The uh, uh, fact that maybe we use more fifths than, than uh, uh, normally in harmony structures before, and, and that they use a, a pattern that's uh, vaguely familiar. Uh, they did so much with their music, they've created so many things that, that uh, I didn't feel anyway, I was just, like Donald says, I was glad it, the, the industry needed it. And it's really, it's been beneficial to everybody. Mm -hmm. Same as with Presley. When Presley came out, the whole industry picked up. Mm -hmm. well, the music of now is, you know, we see it in the, in the commercials. and Well, it's everywhere. It's on FM. And it's on in Multiplex. Movies. In the movies. You know, it's there. Mm -hmm. And it's on, it's on Broadway. We saw hair while we were <coughs> in, um, in uh, New York this last trip. What's, what's happened to country meanwhile, though? I hear people like uh, uh, Glenn Campbell, who sounds quite different from what we heard 15 years ago. Country music? Yeah, to, to well, country, country music, um, the one the drawback in country music is they don't let enough uh, young people into it. They're that's beginning how, to now. That's how rock and roll really started, is that is the uh, Grand Ole Opry not absorbing Buddy Holly, us, and you have Presley, outlet, and everybody. You know, it's, 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 it's a monopoly. You have the one outlet. If you're not Grand Ole Opry country music, you're not really country music. The rest mm -hmm. of it is, uh, you know, I've, you can see the local type. I shouldn't say it probably, but the local type country musician isn't necessarily a good example of what good country musicianship is all about. I don't know why. I think that you, uh, it's a home, a down home catering, you know, selling rose bushes and Bibles and things. At least and pinto ponies. And pinto ponies. You know, it, uh, it's a bit uh, too too family-ish. They mm -hmm. th there's a rule. There's a rule attitude in the cities that uh, the country music that that should be sophisticated enough that it can go anywhere and play. Well, I think that probably answers your question why why like people like Glenn Campbell aren't like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is the country sophisticated? Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about like country is like outside the city or down south or wherever you're, they've got television and they see everything. Yeah, and they are, they're sophisticated. The city, they aren't too. they aren't like uh, spitting at the uh, uh, you know the sp a top pot belly stove yeah, years anymore. Ago, they them Nobody them. has a pot belly stove like. Uh, our grandfather's got to indoor plumbing now, and when he reaches him, it reaches everybody, I figure. <laughs> and he's got television. And, so uh, that's why there's no need for that sort of down-home... Country music now, I think, is pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, Buck Owens... Uh, he's good music. Uh, uh, Merle Haggard, and, you know, and things like that. that that's, that's well, don't we seem forward. to be moving toward an absolute, maybe just dropping of all these uh, arbitrary labels? Well, they're stupid a, anyhow. A they one always, kind of music? Uh, labels they'll have always, always been they'll change, the, they'll change the labels, <sighs> but they'll, you know, they'll, always, they'll always be some sort of label. I heard about psychedelic music before I, they, they'd found the bands. You know, everybody says, have you heard the psychedelic sounds? And nobody had, because they haven't found one to put it on yet. I'm still not sure what it is. And nobody is. Oh, wow. <laughs> the industry <laughs> just hoping there's something there to sell. Well, is there anything else we ought to include? I know we have to kind of get with it here. Uh, anything that I've, that I've overlooked and just kind of piecing together this thing that we should uh, include? Nothing I can think of offhand. We hit every uh, the high points. Seem like it. <laughs> Maybe a few of the low ones too. Uh,